wanted to demonstrate kind of a classic reformed floater here. Um, when I say classic, it's very characteristic. You'll see that there's a very skinny but dense backbone to it. Got to trace that down there. And then it has kind of a fuzzy coating to it. That should show up quite well. And then just like you're drawing, there's these little tentacles that kind of come off. There's one, two, three-ish. And then down here is a little cluster. I think, you know, where you said there's like kind of like a little denser cluster and some, mm -hmm. some little, uh, little tentacles coming off that. So <clears throat> one of the things I go through when I, you know, when I think to myself, is this person the candidate for treatment? Is can I see something? Well, yeah, obviously here. Uh, then the other thing is like, how well does uh, the thing that I'm looking at correlate with the patient I was trying to describe? This is 100%. Like, I, you know, I, <laughs> uh, the drawing is perfect for this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the good news about this, this is fairly anterior. That's towards the front half of the eye, so we're nowhere near the retina. The retina is way, way back there. Um, and I have my two little green uh, lights, and when those two lights are lined up on top of each other, that's where my precise focus is. So the question is, how do I want to approach this? Do I, do I start at the end of the tentacles and try to work my way in? Do you divide and conquer? The problem with that is you start to get you know, fractured pieces all over the place. These are pretty light. Let's go after this here. Let's see how that behaves. And then it kind of moves things around a little bit. Sometimes a lot. laser does have some impact. Sometimes it will, you know, push the laser posterior closer to the retina. And sometimes it'll create a little traction to kind of pull it towards you. So a couple couple shots back there moved the tip of that floater closer to the lens. So I didn't continue at the end there. And then this part has been pushed back a little bit. So it's a little more minimal. And for this, I'm just kind of starting at one end and it feels more controlled this way rather than divide, 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 divide and have pieces all over the place. It's, it sounds nice on paper, but it kind of starts to fall apart sometimes. The whole plan kind of falls apart, and then you just kind of get what you get. But this almost feels a little controlled. All right, so let's talk about why floaters form, and also, more importantly, why they reform. First, a little bit about the structure of, of the vitreous. So the vitreous space is right here. If we took a little bit of that vitreous and greatly magnified it, what we would see in the dark lines here are these long-stranded structural collagen strands. And now collagen is sticky, so naked nude collagen strands want to stick together. So in red, uh, I've tried to represent a, a non-stick coating comprised of a complex here called hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is hydrophilic, means it's water loving. It wants to imbibe in and hold on to water. So we have this simple but relatively stable composition of the vitreous that keeps that optically clear for decades. Uh, and this is that configuration. Now, over time and age and lots of trips around the sun, lots of birthdays, there might be a stripping down and a, and a change and a, and a destabilization where we lose this hyalur hyaluronic acid coating. If that's the case, then these collagen strands will come and stick together. And I, I use the example, if I had a couple pieces of duct tape, and I should have them as a visual aid, you wave them around independently, uh, they're just fine until they stick together. Then it takes a lot more work to kind of pull them apart because of that local attraction. So similarly, if you start to get these collagen fibers that are all kind of stuck together, they don't want to unstick. That is a floater. So when um, people come to me and I do my laser treatment, and uh, especially if it's not a Weiss ring, not a membrane, not the cobweb and strands, but especially if we have a uh, kind of a dense, uh, optically dense, cloudy, cineresis type of floater, uh, I can treat that. I can treat that with the laser. And the laser does a couple of things. Primarily what I'm trying to do, and, and especially if I can do it efficiently, is to use the laser to get in there and vaporize and destroy these proteins, convert them to gas bubbles. If you watch my videos, you can see the bubbles coming off them. Destroy those so that they don't come back. Um, the Weiss rings, the, the, the more denser, the more plasticky, the more brittle they are, they absorb the laser energy better, and those will vaporize and, and fragment a bit. You know, I have to chase down those over the next couple of treatments to, to reduce those as well. 
the cloudier floaters are a lot more frustrating. I can treat them, and that evening, that person might say, man, this is the best I've seen in a long time. That big, dense, obstructive cloud was gone. And then I woke up the next morning, and um, overall, the vitreous was clearer, but now I had this thing, this typically um, dense backbone with the fuzzy strand, just like we're seeing in the video. That is a classic reform floater. You can look at that and say, that is reform. Um, well, what do you do with that? Well, you, d you do more treatment. So generally, I'm all about managing people's expectations. And one of those is this can happen. It's not a complication. It is part of the process, right? Uh, to borrow from the software industry, it's not a bug. It's a feature. It's a feature of that cloudy mess of stuff. Now, what is observable, and again, going back to the treatment video, is there is this very prominent thing. And by the way, that is very, very bothersome, right? I wouldn't expect anybody to just say, oh, one treatment, you got this reformation, oh, well, learn to live with it. This is also very, very treatable as you're watching in the video. Um, but also, you know, after that has reformed, you have less diffuse stuff, and it seems to just coalesce into this compacted and, and, and treatable floater, but the surrounding vitreous is usually a lot cleaner and a lot better. So it's kind of like I say, you know, taking three or four steps forward and one or two steps back. You're making progress, but you have these setbacks and it's just built into the process and, and kind of expect that if that's the type of floater you have. Now, if you don't know this in advance and you had a treatment or two and you go back home and you have the same kind of reform, yeah, that's awkward. Uh, that's inconvenient. Uh, depending on the distance you have to travel, that's expensive as well. Uh, and it's not unusual to have those people back a few months later, get in there and do some cleanup. It's, it's, it's le I wish it didn't happen, but, but it happens. And I feel bad for them. Um, but that stuff is still treatable. It just requires more treatment. Um, where I think you might find, especially like on social media, if, if they don't know about this, they get a treatment and they go home and this happens and they're thinking, well, that didn't work, you know. And especially if the doctor doesn't have much experience and the doctor's like, well, I don't know what to say. You know, I tried my best. Uh, that just betrays the fact that they don't have very much experience. So um, I am all about trying to reduce risk, uh, always trying to manage and re-manage people's expectations. And I found that people, human nature, people are pretty forgiving of imperfection and reformation is a form of imperfection or inefficiency anyways, people are pretty forgiving if they understand it in advance and they don't feel like the doctor is bamboozling them, gaslighting them, uh, making stuff up as they go along. So uh, this is uh, the bane of my practice. I don't like it, it's part of the practice. And so I just kind of go into it. When I, when I do my initial evaluation consultation, I look at that person, uh, sometimes I can quickly look in there and say, it's that type of floater, um, these are harder to treat, they're inefficient to treat, these just generally take more treatments in part because of the expectation of that reformation. So that's, uh, that's a formation and reformation of floaters in a nutshell. Let's get back to the video. does have a very organic look to it, like it's mm -hmm. some sort of like sea creature, you know, when they take those uh, deep sea submarines and they discover life forms for the first time and they're like, we're down by this deep sea <laughs> vent and there's a creature we've never documented before. Uh, this would be that creature. Either that or the aliens have uh, visited you at night and <laughs> this is the developing embryo. So we we're talking a little bit how when these things reform, it's super frustrating, of course, frustrating for you, frustrating for me, and much mm -hmm. rather everything be a lot more efficient than this. Um, but I was trying to reassure or corroborate what you were saying where the surrounding vitreous actually looks 
good and it does mm -hmm. like the rest of it just looks really really good whereas before you had a lot of mm -hmm. random kind of strands and fibers and stuff so I, I think the process is you know you break it break all this stuff down into smaller little little microscopic little bits and pieces then that liberates them from, from wherever they were stuck to and then and, and probably the vitreous is liquefied a little bit and so they find each other and they form these reformed floaters. So if I can get this without much reformation, mm -hmm. ideally no reformation, mm -hmm. and the vitreous looks pretty clean, that would be great. Of course, reformer is going to reform mm -hmm. and uh, so if we can break this down to where you know, whatever reforms this week is a lot smaller and a lot less and less bothersome, well that would still feel like progress, I guess. Ten minutes later. Well, I am feeling good about this. Junk out the periphery out there. Stuff a little softer. Not quite as distinct as that thin line. And I don't want to go and chase stuff that's too far in the periphery because it's probably stuck out there and probably not very symptomatic. And then that's the stuff that is this, you know, break mm -hmm. that up, that becomes a substrate of more more reformation, so then mm -hmm. you feel like you're chasing your tail. So I want to get enough, but not too much. How do you know what's too much? Good question.